Welcome to Older Military Radio TV and we're lifelong Catholics. And what we do is all for free and for our love of Jesus Christ and for our Holy Mother, the Church. And we'll defend our Holy Mother, the Church. Today's program is on the fraudulent cases of saints and how it deals in with the CIA's doctrinal warfare program to destroy the faith of the of the faithful. Welcome, Brother Alexis. Thank you, AJ, for having me back on all the military radio TV. Your unique Catholic apostle. We talk about all things in the light of faith, and uh, you give a lot of emphasis on uh, exposing the corruption in the church so Catholics know who is really the enemy and what are the problems that need to be covered. And let's hope that this recording goes well, because the first time we attempted to record this, our little friends and Homeland Security so scrambled the Skype channel that the recording was useless. But you know, when they do that, we come back a second time and do it even better. So <clears throat> most people don't know that under John Paul II, there was like a, a saint factory. There was money being made. We talked about that before, but maybe for those who didn't listen, what's that all about, AJ? So to open the cause for beatification, the people behind it would have to pay $75,000 to $100,000. Then when it was deemed worthy in the advance for the canonization, then you would have to cough up another 750000 or more. And now, uh, oh, there's even more fat payments? And uh, under John Paul II, it became a billion dollar industry. Okay, so uh, this might shock a lot of Catholics, and we're not saying it to shock you, to hurt your faith, but to understand what's going on and what motivations are. And this should put a question in your mind whether these people are really in saints. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the Vatican has been doing things like this since the Middle Ages, selling indulgences. It's not really the sale of indulgences, it's you give us money and we'll give you an indulgence. Well, it's that's pretty close to a sale of indulgence. It's uh, uh, actually when you give charity, Christ promised you a reward in heaven. But the Vatican's kind of like uh, industrialized it. And you can get a papal blessing in Rome. You can even write to Rome and send us an amount of money and you'll get a blessing of the whole parchment, a beautiful parchment says the Holy Father gives you his blessing. And I remember seeing that near the door of my grandfather's house. And he took so much pride that Pius XII had given his, his family a blessing. So it is a good thing, but when you can walk into any little, uh, you know, 7-Eleven kind of store in Rome and, and plop down 60 euro and uh, uh, fax an order for a papal blessing and then get it, have it arrive by mail anywhere in the world, it's getting a bit commercial. You know, It, it certainly does help. But uh, if there's that kind of money going, being exchanged, we have to ask the question, and that's what we're going to do in this program, whether the person was worthy of being canonized. So we're not saying these people aren't in heaven. We're saying that they're not good examples of the Christian faith, because the whole purpose of canonization is not to put someone in heaven. It's to say the church is relatively certain they're in heaven, in heaven and therefore you can pray to this person and ask for favors from God. Uh, but if they're not certainly in heaven, and this system's messed up, a lot of people's prayers are in vain because they might be praying to someone who's in heaven but doesn't have any merits to help them, okay? Like we all have relatives who are probably in heaven. and and But the church doesn't uh, encourage us to pray to them because they probably don't have, you know, the merits to help us. You need a super abundance of merits. If you just get the purgatory, and by the prayers of masses and all your relatives, you make it to heaven. You 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 don't have a positive balance sheet when you get to heaven. It's zero, okay? Or it may be very small plus in your favor because you didn't do some great things like you know great saints did, like Francis Xavier who baptized ten thousand people in a day, or Saint Francis who was stigmatized and found an order that that led to uh, the inspiration of more than a thousand saints in the church. You know those are great merits. So uh, we're not saying these people aren't in heaven, but we're saying if the canonization property process is corrupted, 
then your prayers be in vain because you're going to someone who can't help you when you should be going to a saint that can help you, which is obviously clear, like Our Lady can help you and St. Michael the Archangel can help you. But we're going to talk about some individuals today and can they really help you? And uh, don't think that these scandals just happened after Vatican II. So you all you tradies out there know this happened even before the council. I'm going to start with that. Some people can make absolutely clear that we're not picking on and we're not we're not putting this argument in a you know tratty modernist narrative. That's not what this is about. This is about something much more important. Did they cut me off, AJ? No. Not yet. So we're going to touch on the real Saint Therese of the Sioux. And um, you might wonder, the real St. Therese? Um, yeah. AJ, did I bring it? You're okay. Hold on, folks. Brothers, uh, Justin, his signal here. But all right. Okay. Uh, what was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, the the last statement about how it's not just after Vatican II that this was happening, but way back when. Okay. Yeah. So I'm saying that because I don't want anyone to think that we're presenting this show to be part of the debate between pro-Vatican II and against Vatican II, or tragedy and modernist. It's something much more important. This is the Catholic faith itself. And so um, we're going to start with Therese of the Child Jesus, the Little Flower. And we're not saying she's not a saint, the just didn't work miracles. But what's the problem with her writings, AJ? Yeah, she did not write everything she over 90,000 pages were written either by her actual sisters or the nuns of the Lazu convent yeah and there's this, like 7,000 changes in the manuscript she wrote and the manuscript the nuns until the modern day claimed that she wrote so that, that book the little flower the autobiography is saint Teresa, little flower she did not write that book mm -mm. but you could say she wrote the fundamental parts of it but yeah. the rest she didn't write now that's a problem isn't it aj why because that book got her to be proclaimed doctor of the church yeah so now here this is a serious problem now, what is a doctor of the church? A doctor of the church is a theologian, male or female, who wrote something that's so significant and influential in the life of the church that uh, they are considered a master in theology, uh, uh, someone to go to to get sound doctrine. And who are the doctors of the church? Like St. Uh, Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, Saint Pope St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Leo the Great. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, Banyaregio, those two are the principal doctors of the church. You have St. Augustine, which is the doctor of the West. You have St. John Chrysostom. These are all men who wrote thousands and thousands of pages of, of, of theology or homilies that have instructed generations, millennium of Catholics. And uh, just because you're a saint doesn't make you a doctor of the church. St. Francis wrote a all St. Francis' writings together is about as twice as long as the, the little fly, the autobiography of St. Teresa of the Child, Jesus. And he's not a doctor of the church, and yet he founded an order that's given us something like uh, 500 saints and 800 or 1,200 blesseds. And, uh, uh, you know, so let's, let's put this in perspective now. So I understand modern times they want women saints, but, you know, Teresa of uh, Avila, a 16th century saint, great mystic. She wrote a whole slew of books, and she's a doctor of the church. 
but very profound teachings in her thing. So Teresa of the Child Jesus of the, of the Little Flower, if she didn't write that book, it's not legitimate she has that title because mm -hmm. the doctrine is not her doctrine. Okay, it's one thing to write the book, another thing to have a book that contains your doctrine. You know, if I write a book about St. Francis's uh, theology, that book that I write shouldn't make be the grounds on which St. Francis is declared a doctor of the church. It's just not right. It has to be his writing. Otherwise, we're playing games with titles. Now, does this hurt anything? Well, actually, in theology, being called a doctor of the church doesn't really give you any authority, except in certain kinds of argumentation. And uh, it doesn't mean you're more in heaven or less in heaven. It's kind of a publicity stunt. But it's not right. It's an offense to all the other doctors of the church. And it misleads the people. How long has it been known that her writings were manipulated? Uh, how, how many years have they known this? About nine, uh, what is it, 90 years? Yeah, about 90 years. And uh, John, John Paul II um, uh, made her a doctor of the church anyhow. So that's just not honest. OK, it's, it's not honest. So this this opens the door that if they're not honest in something that's very important on the level of theology, how about other things? So AJ, what's the fundamental problem with canonizations after Vatican II? They, they changed the process, didn't they? Yeah, right. They got rid of the devil's advocate, which was to question everything to make sure that that the person in the process of sainthood, that everything is scrutinized and once they pass through all the scru scrutiny in the crucible, they are true actual saints and and their their life and everything is one you should you would want to imitate and want to look up to and um, mm -hmm. now if the masons somehow could get the church to start canonizing people who weren't saints who are kind of like a little masonic now and maybe 10 years from now a little more masonic and maybe in 10 more years environmentalists or marxist uh would that be serving their agenda what is their agenda the cia and, and what are they out to do since 53. They, their agenda is to destroy the faith of the faithful to get them where they are lukewarm at best, cold in the faith is what they want, where they're not practicing, not living it, not studying it, not not looking like into the stuff that we're looking into. They just want them to be dumbed down and sheep and follow follow along. Mm -hmm. We've seen this in the recent canonizations of martyrs. Uh, in Latin America, many of whom were involved in Marxist revolutionary movements. Now, if you canonize these people and you start putting your icons in church, people are going to start thinking of being a faithful Catholic as being a Marxist. And that is the agenda of liberation theology. Mm -hmm. And that is what uh, the followers of Pope Francis are pushing. Certainly Bergoglio has pushed that his whole life. And uh, despite all his proclamations that he's not in favor of uh, liberation theology, that's just a bunch of bunk. So this is a very serious thing. And so now we're going to discuss some individual cases of saints. What saint do you want to start with, AJ, who was canonized under John Paul II? Yes, yeah, Sister Faustina Kowalska. Yeah, so this is the sister who we get the divine mercy devotion from. And um, there were objections, very strong objections against her, her holiness, her, her this devotion before the council. What was that all about and uh, why it's important to us to remember? Yeah, so. The two decrees from the, from the Holy Office. Supreme Congregation of the Holy Office and the plenary meeting held on November 19, 1958 made the following decisions regarding 
Sister Faustina Kowalska's Divine Mercy Devotion. The supernatural nature of the revelation made to Sister Faustina is not evident. No feast of Divine Mercy is to be instituted. It is forbidden to divulge images and writings that propagate this devotion under the form received by, this, by Sister Faustina. In the second decree, March 6, 1959, the diffusion of images and writings promoting devotion and divine mercy under the form proposed by the same Sister Faustina was forbidden. The prudence of the bishop is to judge as to the removal of the aforesaid images that are ready displayed for public honor. Mm -hmm. Now, these, this decree might seem kind of abstract, but the Vatican took a very strong position under the reign of John the 23rd, who was by no mean a traditionalist. And uh, for important reasons, the first important reason is there's already devotion in the church to the divine mercy. It's called the devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. And that was revealed to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque in the 17th century by numerous miracles, extraordinary miracles and has resulted in the conversions of millions of souls, the promotion of hundreds of thousands of vocations, male and female religious and to the priesthood, and, and countless and continual um, um, miracles of grace in people's family, from the protection of homes during war, to the reunion of families, to the conversion of sinners. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. But what's missing in the divine mercy? When we look at the image of the divine mercy, of, Sister Kal Faustina Kalaska. <clears throat> there are no wounds on the hands, the feet, or the side, and no markings where the crown was. Mm -hmm. And there's no sacred heart in the middle of Christ's chest. Now, you don't have to put the sacred heart in the middle of every image of Christ's chest. That's true. But what's coming out of the middle of his chest in the divine mercy uh, image? Red and white light. Yeah, OK, so this is another problem. The church has always been very sensitive to the uh, Gnostic reinterpretation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when Christ rises from the dead, he rose body and soul from the dead. He actually still could walk, talk, eat and drink. That's he. He did have the ability to pass through locked doors and solid walls. That is true. And move at the speed of thought, which is the quality of the resurrected body. But he ate and drank in the presence of the apostles. And Thomas would not have said, you know, let me put it, my finger in his wounds of the hand inside. And Christ said, OK, bring it on um, <clears throat> if he didn't actually have a body. So he's not a ghost. And the first heresy to attack Catholicism was Gnosticism in the first century. The Apostle John speaks about it in his letters and, and wrote about it in, in the Apocalypse. It's a very dangerous thing. So you try to insist with pagan Greeks that our soul identity is our soul and our spirit. The body is to be left in this world, and in the world to come, we won't have bodies. So this is one of the key criteria to discern whether you've seen Jesus Christ or not in a, in a mystical vision. Do you see his body? If you don't see his body, or if the body appears to be a ghost, so exchanging, that's why Christ appears, when Christ appears to the saints, he has his wounds. You see the wounds in his side, or you see his heart, or you see his suffering and his blood as he appeared to Padre Pio, completely crucified in his face. And then we have the holy face devotion. So there's, there's no heart there, but... Um, there's other things about this devotion are strange. What are they, AJ? Yeah, I'm going to quote from this last pe last paragraph on fish eaters. It is perhaps not accidental that Pope John Paul II promoted this devotion, for it is very much in line with his encyclical, Deves and Misericordia. In fact, the Paschal Mystery theology that he taught pushed aside all consideration of the gravity of sin and the need for penance for satisfaction to the divine justice and hence of the mass of the of as being as exp, expiatory sacrifice and likewise the need to gain indulgence and to do works of penance since god is infinitely merciful and does not count our sins all this considered of no consequence 
This is not the Catholic spirit. We must make reparation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world, as the Sacred Heart repeatedly asked at Par le, le Monial. It is the renewal of our consecration to the Sacred Heart and frequent holy hours of reparation that is going to bring about the conversion of sinners. It is in this way that we can cooperate in bringing about his kingdom of merciful love because it is the perfect recognition of the infinite holiness of the divine majesty and complete submission to his rightful demands. Mercy only means something when we understand the price of our redemption. Excellent. Do we know the name of the author name on that? Father Peter Scott. Oh, Father Peter Scott of the SSXP. <laughs> and uh, but that there are things you could disagree about with Father Scott, who has a personal reputation. But what that is perfect Catholic theology, and I'll unpack it here scripturally. How do we know that what Father Scott just said is Catholic? Because Christ doesn't say, "Believe in the gospel and you will be saved." What does he say? Repent and believe the gospel. And then after he says, repent and believe the gospel, what does he say? Follow me. And as all the great saints say, follow him where? You follow him to Calvary. Because though he has redeemed you, you must be redeemed. Though he has obtained the forgiveness of your sins, you must expiate their punishment. And this is why all the saints practiced penance. It's not sufficient, as in the devotion of divine mercy, that you ask God to grant you mercy. Uh, the Christian religion does not consist solely in asking God to give me gifts 24-7. That's consumerist theology. That's not Christianity. Christianity is you want the gift, you accept the cross, and you become united to Christ crucified. That's why some of the greatest saints, like Catherine of Siena or St. Francis, or St. Paul, had the stigmata. Uh, they were afflicted. Padre Pio worked thousands of miracles, but he was crucified every day of his life for like 50 years. So um, as the medievals, the medievals did, when someone was claimed to be a saint and died, the first thing they do, would do is strip the body. Because if that person had never suffered anything, they would doubt he's a saint. And we have totally forgotten that with Vatican II. The Novus Ordo is a Christianity without the cross. And this is why when the Novus Ordo gets introduced, all around the world they take down the crucifixes and they put a risen Christ or a Christ who just came out of Gold's Gym. There's no more wounds. There's no more suffering. There's no more disfigurement. Mm -hmm. And this is why devotion to uh, the Shroud of Turin has kind of brought that back around the world. You see how brutally Christ was crucified and how much he was disfigured. And um, this is a grave error. In the religious orders, there's no more fasting anymore. There's no more abstinence. There's no more silence anymore. Uh, there's, there's no more, uh, you know, abstain from meat for three years to, if you need that to become chaste. There's no more heroic penances or prayers or sacrifices. There's still some places in the world where you see, like Catholics in Mexico, walking miles and miles on their knees in excruciating pain to do penance for their sins or the sins of some loved one. And this is part of the Catholic faith. It is not a medieval aberration. It is the true teaching of Jesus Christ. And um, the devotion of thine mercy just, you know, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't get there. Um, maybe some people inspired to that, but I don't know a single person who, who started that devotion who <laughs> imitates that, you know, who said well. But that's not the only thing. There's some other strange things. Did Sister Faustina Klaus, uh, was she an example of humility? No. And uh, uh, what, I think Phil, Phil Lawler wrote something about her, which was very good. Uh. He objected to her canonization. I was quite surprised because he's usually a yes man. And um, yeah, and he also wrote about her and then wrote again the same way on John Paul II. Okay, so on um, 
Uh, if I'm confused, and she, he didn't write about Carl Oscar only on JP2. We'll get to that when we get to the canonization of JP2. But uh, some of, did he write on Sister Faustina? Am I correct? Uh, no, let me. Oh, on JP2. Uh, okay. Where is it? No, uh, I don't know. Tradition action. Oh, tradition action. OK, so let's read what tradition action said about Sister Faustina Kalowska. I don't agree with everything on tradition and action. OK, but when it comes to theology, they're usually pretty right on the mark. OK, so. Uh, da, 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 da. OK, so the. Uh, let's see who's right in this. It is by Monsignor Patrick Perez. Uh, he writes on her writings. The long thread of statements supposedly from our Lord to Sister Faustina has some things that would make a ca correct thinking Catholic very uneasy. To say the least, I will amplify by t taking a few quotes from her writings. On October 2nd, 1936, she states, the Lord Jesus appeared to her and said, Now, I know that it is not for the graces or gifts that you love me, but because my will is dearer to you than life. That is why I am uniting myself with you so intimately as with no other creatures. So he goes into writing, How can we believe that our Lord has united himself more intimately with Sister Faustina then with the Blessed Virgin Mary. At first, we might read this and think, oh, that's beautiful. Later, it'll hit you like it, it will hit you. Wait a minute. Our Lord united himself more intimately with Sister Faustina than with any other creature. Our Lady <laughs> no. was Immaculate Conception. But she was also his creature. She was created by him. As for the rest of us, were all but with the greatest exalted possession, free from original sin from the very beginning. And now we are expected to believe that our Lord told Sister Faustina he is more united to her than anybody else, even his own. Well, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, even his own mother. OK, now this is a very good criticism and it's a very sound one because Christ was united to Our Lady perfectly in will because she was immaculate and full of grace. He was also united to her more intimately than any other human being physically because he was in her womb nine months. So it's obvious that this voice or this imagined voice that she heard was of the devil Mm -hmm. because that is so blasphemous against the divine majesty and the honor of the mother of God, whose dignity is quasi infinite, that it, you cannot approve this person for canonization ever, ever. She was deceived, at least by her own pride, and then to put it in writing. But to have people read that and say, that's OK, that's diabolic. Canonizing her is an affrontery to God and Our Lady. Yep. But there were other strange things. She had visions that kind of go along with the globalist uh, child sacrifice cult, didn't she? Yeah. Uh. What did she what did she see happen? She would see the host turn into the child Jesus during mass. Then what would she see the priest do to the child Jesus? Uh, rip him into pieces and eat him yep and this is one of the main objections a holy office had this is just no way this is just beyond any uh that's not catholic theology when you receive our lord in the blessed sacrament you receive the whole child jesus and if the priest breaks the host in two there's the whole child jesus in each half okay because the way christ is present in the eucharist He's truly, really, and substantially present there, but he's not physically present in a way that you could break him or hurt him, okay? It's kind of like if you took a piece of glass and with a laser made a 3D image on it, and you broke that piece of glass into 10 pieces, each would have the whole image on it, okay? That's an analogy in nature, though Christ is not in the Eucharist as an image. He's there, really, truly, and substantially. 
So uh, this vision is just theologically erroneous. It's grotesque. It's offensive to pious ears, and that's a category for condemnation in the Holy Office before Vatican II. And it would feed into the worst possible accusations of non-Catholics against us, from Jews to Muslims to Protestants. Um, and um, um, she even says that the first time she saw it, she was shocked. But she says in her diary that she saw this countless times. Now, I'm not a disinterested or uninformed party. I've read her entire book. OK, I haven't read all her writings, but I read her book on the Divine Mercy in a good English translation and it's there. And she says it over and over and over again. So that is bizarre. But, you know. Maybe that's why the CIA wanted her canonized. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> What's even worse about this devotion, AJ? Um, if you could worse. <laughs> oh, that, that was worse, but. You get communion in the hand in the church. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, she was given communion in the hand. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Same as by an angel. And add to these examples the preposterous affirmation that the host jumped out of the tabernacle three times and placed itself in her hands so that she had to open up the tabernacle and place it back herself. And the host came back out of the tabernacle and came the rest in my hands. And I with joy placed his back in the tabernacle. This was repeated a second time. And I did the same thing. It happened again. It make it sound like a hamster now that has gotten out of its cage. Oh no, here it is again. I have to go put it back. Okay, that so that's uh, sorry. She said the hamster? Or is yeah. that father criticizing? Oh no, sorry. OK, so now I'll show you why that's probably totally in her imagination or it's diabolic, but it's probably totally in imagination because there have been saints who received our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament through the angelic ministrations. Bonaventure, before he was a priest, while he was a novice, for a week he felt too sinful to receive our Lord, not because he was sinful, but he was so humble. The host elevated from the paten on the altar, floated in midair, and went into his mouth, not on his hands. And this was a man who was destined to become a doctor of the church, a cardinal of the Roman church, the minister general of the order, a bishop and a priest. Then we have the children at Fatima, who were brought communion by the archangel St. Michael, the angel of peace. Did he put it in their hands? No, he didn't. Did he allow them to hold the chalice? No, he didn't. So why to this woman who already has these crazy visions did this kind of bizarre thing happening? That's why it's in her mind and it's twisted and she was mentally unstable and she was. Had no fear of God to say that these things were of God or that they happened. You had no fear of God. OK, and uh, if you can get worse. The followers of this devotion don't even regard the resurrection Easter anymore as an important day. What's the most important day now in the year? Divine Mercy Sunday for those guys. Yeah. I have met them on Good Friday, inviting them to come to a ceremony where the seven last words of Christ would be meditated on and preached on by a priest. And you know what they say? Oh, no, I can't come. I have to do the divine mercy devotion, which begins today and culminates on the sun on divine mercy Sunday. They don't even call it low, you know, low Easter, you know, low Sunday, which is because it's the octave of Easter the Sunday after. Yeah. There can be no day in the calendar of the church that could celebrate the mercy of God more than the resurrection. The resurrection is the solemnity of mercy because it is mercy that God raised Christ from the dead after he died on account of our sins because he could have destroyed the world. At that point, the whole world deserved to be destroyed. The whole cosmos deserved to be wiped out of existence because they had crucified the son of God who was perfectly innocent and no one stopped it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but no, the father raises Christ from the dead and that's mercy. And now Christ opens the doors to heaven and gives us a chance to get to heaven after that absolute betrayal of God. So to say this could be divine mercy in the end of the day is blasphemous, sacrilegious, and diabolic. Mm -hmm. It's called disorientation. This is just exactly what the CIA would want. You know, because, you know, if the Christians don't celebrate Easter anymore, they're not going to offend the Muslims and the Jews. Yeah. Everyone can celebrate Sunday of Divine Mercy. Jews can celebrate Divine Mercy. Muslims can celebrate Divine Mercy. Hindus could celebrate Divine Mercy. Every Protestants could celebrate Divine Mercy. We could all celebrate Divine Mercy. We're just not even stop talking about the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead to get the Divine Mercy. Okay, so. That's the first. Uh, that's a bogus canonization, if you ever say, say it, because it's just theologically unsound. It's been dangerous to the faith. Uh, but papal canonizations are not infallible. Now, what's the next saint we're going to discuss? Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Okay. Uh, um, what were some objections about? Did you find uh, some objections written about her? Um. It, she it was it's like she's just been like she's she she she's on the calendar but no one writes about her anymore and no one's just she just forgotten like prior to her canonization though all the newspapers are talking about her cnn new york times wall street journal wait a moment those are the globalist publications uh -huh. but after she was canonized they never talk about her again yeah. You know, so uh, but there's other strange things. So she was a nun. Uh, I forget the name of the, I think she's a, a sister of uh, Notre Dame. Yeah. And it was an order in Ireland. And she grew up in Albania and she went to India and she was a nun for many years. And then one day she said she heard these voices and uh, she left her order and started caring for the poorest of the poor. And at the beginning, it was only the Tridentine mass, communion noise in the mouth. Oh, we're here to save souls for Jesus. But then it changed. Yeah, money started rolling. She got her fame started to spread. She started to rub elbows with the globalists. She got herself a Nobel Peace Prize. She started to make friends with the Clintons. She had a personal friendship with Hillary Clinton. And, uh, all that doesn't seem to have any fruit. Everything, everything changed. Yeah, she started insisting that sisters receive communion in the hand. That they always have the mass in the vernacular. That her mission on earth was to make, to take a, a, a poor Catholic off the street and make him a good Catholic. And to take a poor Protestant off the street and make him a good Protestant. And take a poor Hindu off the street and make him a good Hindu. And take a poor Muslim off the street and make him a, a good Hindu, a good Muslim. Now, if you are... A, I'm not a nun, I'm a brother, but I can tell you from the nuns I know, the last thing on the face of the earth, a consecrated virgin to Jesus Christ, a spouse of Jesus Christ would say those words. That'd be like a, a married woman saying, I'm here to make any man that comes to my bedroom happy. It's spiritual adultery to the highest degree. It, it's disgusting. Um, um, what a uh, what about um, the miracles or the miracle for her canonization? Uh, yeah. You hear of those. Um. Yeah, they're hard to dig up. I, I, I did. There were some articles about the time of her canonization about the one. I don't know if you could, if you haven't been able to find it. I can recount it because I, I was very interested in this. I thought thought she was a saint. I almost joined her order for men. Yeah. Here. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, 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 oh. Here's the words of the of 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 the words. 
few almost miracles. Almost. <laughs> it's, it's not good enough. We have to know the persons in heaven has to be a, a true miracle that only God can work. So what are these almost miracles? A French girl who said touching a medallion from Saint uh, Mother Teresa healed ribs she broke in a car accident. But this healing did not happen quickly enough to be seen as miraculous. Yeah, because you know your ribs will heal by themselves. Yeah. A Palestinian girl recovered from bone cancer after seeing Mother Teresa in a dream. But the church waits for several years to ensure there is no reoccurrence in cancer cases. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. came back. Well, she used to. So the, the actual case of the canonization at St. Teresa, I mean, uh, Mother Teresa, was based on this. A woman, I think, in India who was dying of cancer and had five doctors treating her with chemo. Five. Okay. So she was dying anyhow. The chemo was not saving her life. So I think her mother took a miraculous medal, prayed to Our Lady, brought it to the tomb of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, left it there for like 30 minutes, then picked it up and brought it back to her daughter. And they prayed to Our Lady and Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And the uh, cancer uh, went into remission and disappeared. Now, in a case like this, what's the first thing the church does? She speaks to the doctors. And the doctors must all agree that it is inexplicable to cure. What did these five doctors say? No, we're not going to agree to that. She was under chemotherapy and she was cured by our medical intervention. There's nothing supernatural in this at all. John Paul II totally ignored that and canonized her. Mm -hmm. And that bastardized to her canonization. Her canonization is theologically null and void. And what he did was a sacrilege if he got money for. It. That's a fraud. And um, I, I'm not certain of this, but I'm almost certain that like five years later, the woman died of cancer. So, or eight years later, she died of cancer. I don't know if it was the same cancer, but you know, um, there was another case of woman in Costa Rica she was diagnosed with uh, brain aneurysm, told that she wasn't going to live. She had a dream of John Paul II. She prayed to him. She went back to another doctor and he said, I don't find any aneurysm. Oh, it's a miracle. Well, you know, it could have been a misdiagnosis. And aneurysms do heal by themselves. Then there was someone with a Parkinson's disease and they prayed to John Paul II and their Parkinson's disease didn't go. Oh, they, they were, washed the mass of his beatification and their Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's disease is an autoimmune disease. That's what your body attacks itself. And you know, your body can stop attacking itself naturally. <laughs> it does happen. And some people with autoimmune diseases, it goes away after several years because the body recognizes it shouldn't be attacking itself. So that's not a strict miracle. So those are the ones I, I mixed the ones with John Paul II in there, right. but it, it's the same sort of thing. You can't, you know, the faithful need true saints to pray to. We need saints for our age that are truly heroic, and that's going to be saints who didn't accommodate with globalism and hobnob with Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it, it's not going to be saints who invented face fakes and claimed they were more holy than Our Lady. Those are not saints. They are either run of the mill Catholics or have problems with egomania or they're uh, uh, inspired by the devil. OK. Um, uh, we should talk about the Santo Subito movement, though. Yeah. Now, For those who don't know that, what was that all about? So right when John Paul II was ha having his funeral, uh, I think it was uh, main celebrant was Carlin Ratzinger. All of a sudden, banners and everything was coming out and people were, and a certain group of people were screaming, Santo Subito for, for John Paul II to be canonized. Mm -hmm. And this started the big push. And it wasn't just a few people. It was like Rome was inundated with one and a half million Catholics who all appeared out of the woodwork. And uh, hundreds of thousands were saying, Santo Subito, Santo Subito. It surprised everyone because no one thought he was a saint. No one in the Vatican at that moment said he was a saint. 
I've lived in Rome several years and I've never met anyone claim he was a saint except some Vatican worker who said to me, of course he was a saint. You should see how he reprimanded bishops in private. I said to the priest, when they deserved a public reprimand, reprimanding in private is cowardice. That's not heroism. Because these weren't private sins these bishops were being reprimanded for. They were public sins. And I never met anyone who says who is actually devoted to him as a saint. You know, I'm going to imitate him. I'm going to be a holy bishop. Well, maybe they do say it out of political reasons, but. But the truth behind this movement is another thing. So what what group was behind organizing this mass protest? Yeah, so. Come on, website. Go back to it. Come on, there we go. Sorry, folks, my website's here, so. The Focular Movement. Yeah, my Clara Lubach. Yeah. And a very influential movement. It's kind of like um, socialist Catholics form good works committees in the parishes and they go out and do good works in the community, but it's really strongly socialist oriented and stuff. And uh, has a, had a rather good reputation until a few years ago when it came out that there was a massive amount of mind control and sexual abuse going on in her organization. But she was the big move about it. Now, I know personally, because I met at San Giovanni Rotondo, one of the original founders of the charismatic movement in Italy, and they told me they knew all about this thing was organized. They were asked to co-organize it. The charismatic renewal in Italy had been, was printing up banners, Santa Subo, months before they, they, he died. And they had it all organized, the bus trips and everything, ready to go for his funeral. And they got tens of thousands to go to this and participate in this protest. And then she told me, she says, we were asked to do this by the U.S. ambassador. AJ, why would the U.S. government want John Paul II canonized? Yeah. So when John Paul II stepped out onto the loggia, the CIA sent a cable saying, we have our man. Operation Gladio, Paul Williams. Get that book if you want to know more about that story, though. AJ will put links in the show page about that whole thing. Uh, John Paul II's uh, recruiting. Can you hear me, AJ? Yeah. OK, because you froze in my end about how the CIA most likely recruited John Paul II before his election. And uh, the program on the, the three-part program on the assassination of John Paul I that John Paul II probably knew who the plotters were and um, profited from that assassination. So. Yeah. So, um, anything else you want to cover? AJ, I want to hear you personally now in your own words, what you feel about fake canonizations. <clears throat> If, like we have done today with just a few of these, I believe once if the church does get a pope that is a pope that is to restore the church, that these fake canonizations are reversed, taken off the calendar, 
all the monuments and everything removed and their special shrines where their tombs are put in proper graves where they are not uh, idolized, worshipped, or adored, or venerated. And also to make sure that the doctor, the list of the doctors of the church are actual doctors of the church and not fraudulent because it had, uh, this and everything else that has been done to hurt the faith. It, it, it's time that all this must be literally ripped from the church so that the faithful no longer fall into hell finally by learning the truth of what has happened and expose all of this so that the church on earth can be just as glorious as it is in heaven. Amen. Thank you for watching today's episode of OMC Radio TV. If you wish to support OMC Radio TV, please join the studio fundraiser. More importantly, please join Order Militaris Catholicus as either a donor or investor. This way, the important work of defending persecuted Christians can continue. Day is full. Day is full.